If we're going to be honest, every single problem that we are seeing in Christ's church can be traced back to a weak man. And if you disagree with me, comment down below. And I want to talk in this video about why modernist Catholics resist men like Bishop Strickland, Archbishop Vigano, the Society, Dr. Taylor Marshall, men like my husband, the bad trad. I am very strong-willed. I am a strong-willed woman. And when I see weakness in men, it just repulses me. I want to run the other direction. And I gravitate towards strength. And I think that these modernists don't want men out there like a Bishop Strickland, for example, talking about the truth of Christ, the truth of our faith, the tradition of our church, because there's so many Catholics who don't know their faith. They were poorly catechized. They haven't done the work to learn their faith. And they hear things like these modernist ideas about female priests and women deacons and all the different ways that we can actively participate in the mass. And they are drawn to that because they don't know the tradition of the church. They don't gravitate towards strength and masculinity. And so much of our church is just overrun with women. We see that so often in the Novus Ordo world. It is women who are running these parishes, women up on the altar, even in our old parish. And we used to belong to the cathedral parish in our city. Every time my husband watches a mass from there, there's a female right next to the bishop. And it's just disturbing for someone like me to see that. And that is why tradition and tradi the traditional Latin mass just deeply resonates with me. So the reason why I think these modernists don't want men like Bishop Strickland out there and they'll do everything that they can to cancel him is because the more Catholics, good, faithful Catholics, learn the truth about the church, the more they're going to have a reaction, I think, like mine. You know, when we were first coming back into the church, and we've been back, I would say, probably 15 years or so, and slowly the Lord was working with us and helping us to see what was happening. And of course, he has allowed these things to happen in his church for a reason, and I think that it was a slow process for us, just slowly peeling back the layers of what was happening, the infiltration that has happened in Christ's church for so long, long before I was even born. And I was born during the whole wake of Vatican II, but I didn't know. I was ignorant of my faith. A lot of it had to do with my childhood. I just, my parents did not prioritize our faith, even though I knew I was Catholic, but it just didn't mean anything. And it's been a slow progression to learn about the faith. So the more we were getting drawn into traditional Catholicism and understanding the orthodoxy of our faith, the truth of the faith, not this reimagined pandering, which is how it seems to me. Like we were pandering to Protestants. We were pandering to women. We were pandering to the people who the church wants to, you know, on the outskirts of society instead of the truth of the church. Instead of the truth of Christ's church, the sacraments, what we need to be able to get to heaven, having strong priests stand in the breach, having men who will sit there and tell us the truth. We just wanted to reinvent Christ's church and try to, I guess, make it seem more of like a Protestant service. And that's what we have in the Novus Ordo in so many places. And I know that there are some parishes who try very hard you know, they'll inject Latin, and this is so much more than just the language. And they try to make it as traditional as they can while they're still in the Novus Ordo world, you know, trying to have one foot in each world. And there is a difference. You know, the Eucharist is the same. I firmly believe that. There is not a difference between a confected Eucharist in the Novus Ordo or in the Latin Mass. Now, whatever camp you're on, I'm sure I'll see some kind of comment down below. But I don't believe that there is a difference. I believe there is a difference in the mass. And I believe that there is a difference in the way that we worship. I believe that there is a difference in the atmosphere that we are in. And when we have allowed this Protestant mindset to infiltrate our church, infiltrate the mass, and we see the fruit of that when we have 70% of Catholics who, who attend mass who don't believe in the real presence, that is disturbing. 
And when we have this full on onslaught of people just coming for traditional Catholics, and there is a difference. I know people want to sit there and say, we should just say Catholic, but there is a difference. There is a split in the church. And if we're being honest, we all know that it's true. So saying something like traditional Catholic, modernist Catholic, I think that sometimes it's appropriate. You know, we believe different things. You know, we want different things. For me, I just want the truth of the faith. I want to be able to worship the Lord. I don't want any theatrics. I don't want to pander to Protestants or any other group. I simply want to worship the Lord. And that's why the Latin Mass means so much to me. So men like Bishop Strickland, who stand up clearly and will tell us the truth, priests like Father Dave Nix, Padre Peregrino, that will stand up and tell us the truth, Father Mark Goring, will stand up and tell us the truth. I gravitate towards men like that who aren't afraid of the personal consequences of their boldness of proclaiming Christ, being absolutely unapologetic for their faith. And that's how I want to be. I will always gravitate towards a bishop like Bishop Strickland. I will always look towards strength in the church. I don't want a feminized church. And I think that it's I I think that it's a lie. I don't think that true feminine women are looking for our voice to be heard in the priesthood. I don't think that women like me, mothers, wives, grandmothers are looking to put on the Roman collar and LARP priest. I, I just don't think that that is true. I think that we are being manipulated and we have to resist that. We have to push back against this woke ideology that is just steam rolling through our churches. And we have to speak out. You know, I just have a little tiny channel here, a little voice on a little part of YouTube, and maybe somebody will hear it. But we have to be bold with our faith. We have to follow in the steps of a Bishop Strickland, who is doing Christ's work. He is putting the laity behind him, and saying, you're going to have to come through me. And I really appreciate that as a lay Catholic woman who is doing my very best to keep myself in a state of grace, falling more times than I should, frequenting the sacraments, coming back to Christ over and over and over again, just like the prodigal. And it means something to me that there are shepherds out there in the world who still recognize the sheep that are out there who are so hurting and lost and looking for strength in Christ's church. Please pray for the men in the church like Bishop Strickland and pray even harder for the men in the church like Pope Francis. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. All right, moving on. Moving on. What's the strangest or most strangest or most unconventional way You've ever seen someone practice their faith. And we have well, to do this fast. Okay. Because we're taking a lot of time and well, we have you know, a lot of questions. Yeah. So we'll just, um, so I think the weirdest thing that ever happened to me as a Catholic was, I don't know why we were there. I think it was when we got invested. Was it when we got invested in the brown scapular? What? I don't know why we were there. We were at, it wasn't a mass. We were, but we were in our oh, parish. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It wasn't the brown scapular. It was just a talk given by. Was it Doug Barry? No, no, no. It was, I don't want to say his name because I don't want to. Oh, it was a friend of my older brother. Remember, he and his, oh, his oh, wife. Oh, okay, so they we went did to like this. We didn't know it was a charismatic. Type but that of was situation. the talk. Yeah, it was a charismatic. Type. No, we, no, no. I don't think that that. I don't think we're on. No, because whatever we had gone to, I was not upset with at the beginning. But when we were leaving, they were doing some kind of weird charismaticy thing, or yes, what? Yes, that's the same one. It was the same and thing. They, they had all all of us put out our hands. Yeah, and I don't do that. Yeah, so I don't and, do that. Yeah, and no, that was that wasn't Doug Barry. It was the first time I had ever seen something like that. Experience when he something asked, like that. Everybody, extend your hands. And I'm just like, and this was probably the face I was doing then too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like looking at him. It was the I. If and you're just, into the charismatic, if, if you're into the charismatic thing, okay. I know Father Mark Goring is charismatic. Absolutely. We and love I, him. We love Father Mark. And I'm I, not about I would put that. Put him up against. Yeah, and he, he's a and see, holy and that's another man. thing that's Father so Mark. beautiful about our faith. There's people like Father Mark Goring, charismatic Catholics. There's people like Father Ripiger, who I don't wouldn't assume would be like a charismatic, right. whatever. Right. 
And depending on where you are in the faith and what you need, that's the kind of priest that you're going to gravitate towards. I love Father Mark Goring. I think he's a great man, Absolutely. what have you. Absolutely. But the whole charismatic movement and the ha- all that, that's not where you're going to get me. Like and I speaking in time, he was speaking in, in tongues t- too. Yeah, I didn't like that. And not I remember, Father Mark. No, I mean, and I remember I posted or... on Facebook after that. Like that was yeah, the first time yeah. I was like rattled about the whole Catholic thing. I'm like, what have you? Where? What has happened? All to I us? knew was the guy knew my older brother. Yeah, so we thought Greg. we were just going to go and to a little happy I, talk. I, yeah, and I was I was shooketh. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah, it wasn't that wasn't. Uh, yeah, that was yeah, not good. Yeah. yeah, no, we didn't go back to that. No. For me. It strangest. Had you experienced something like that before? Yeah, unfortunately, mm. yeah, as a kid, mm-hmm. my parents got into that side of the Catholic Church mm-hmm. and all that. But um, and that was interesting. Of course, this was the NO when we were still going NO. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So we got to right, move so on. So that's all we have. To we have to move on. on. One from anonymous. Have you ever experienced a crisis of faith, and how did we support each other through it? Back when we first got married, I did have I go th- I, I did go through a period where I was doubting. The existence of God, very slightly. I, I never, you know, I, w- I wouldn't say I went atheist or even agnostic. I but I had I had struggled with doubts. Didn't want to, and I still prayed. I, I prayed fervently that I would, that this would resolve, and that you know I would find a way, you know, to just truly just be able to believe in God fully and completely. And the reason was my job. Okay, and. I know what a lot of people think. Well, you know, you're a cop. You see a lot of death and destruction and evil. And for me, it was never the problem with evil. I could, I could reconcile evil and there being a God. The thing that threw me, I'll never forget this. It was, I, I, I was the first one on scene of a, a crash involving a motorcycle, a pickup truck towing a trailer and another vehicle. Won't go into all the details, but the motorcycle had the the driver and then a rider on the back. They ended up skidding on the side and there was a big pipe that was coming out from the trailer that the truck was towing. Missed the driver by a hair, but got the passenger right through the eye, out the back of the head, killed him instantly. And I just remember, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I rush up to, I'm trying to render aid as best I can and I see this and I hear the story that from the driver and the thing that struck me was the randomness or the seeming randomness of it all. That just, it kind of threw me. I'm sure the enemy had something to do with this too, seizing that opportunity. And I just, I, I really started doubting. And I'm like, yeah, you know, but I, I, I knew that I could never be, a, you know, an atheist or even an, an agnostic. I, so I, I wanted to be a believer. So I, you know, I scratched and clawed my way back and you helped me with that a lot. And, you know, so that was my, I think that was my worst crisis of faith. I mean, you know, and I still, but I still brought everybody to mass. I still, you know, I hate to say it, but went through the motions. So I didn't want the girls to even know that I had this kind of doubt. Um, and it, it ate me up inside. It did. And it, I mean, it didn't last long and probably a little bit less than a year or so, but I, and I really struggled with it, but, and that, geez, that's going back 25 years mm-hmm. or so, but mm-hmm. yeah. I think I've really had a crisis of faith in that I've doubted God or I was unsure of my faith. I think that I was more almost feeling like I'm doing all these things right or what I think is right, yet these bad things that. keep happening. And it's such an immature way, I think, to look at the faith and look at God and why he permits things to happen to us, always for our good. But it doesn't feel like that. At least to me, it didn't feel like that. Like, you know, I'm praying the rosary. I'm doing this stuff. I'm trying to submit to my husband. Yet thing after thing keeps happening. Why am I not getting rewarded? You know, and then I had this moment where I'm like, look at Our Lady, you know, perfect, sinless, did everything right. And no one suffered more than her. You know, what no creature suffered more than her. And so I'm like, so my little inconveniences or whatever, how silly am I to ask, you know, I'm doing everything you're asking. Why are you still letting these bad things happen to me? So and it, was it really almost like you were thinking like a vending machine type. I'm doing yeah, like rosary, if I I'm do doing all the good stuff, why, then I'm gonna yeah. get good stuff back. And it was so It's like the health and wealth gospel. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I have to like really fight those kind of feelings like and then that's just something that um 
so I don't think it's a crisis of faith. I think it's just growing in my faith and becoming more mature in my faith and understanding that for as long as I live, you know, crosses and trials are going to come, and, but it's always because God loves me and it's always to make me a better Catholic, better wife, better mother, better grandmother, all the things so I can know, love, and serve him better by the things that he allows me to carry in my life. Good answer. Thank I like you. that. Thank you. If you could ask the Pope one question, what would it be? Oh, can I go? Yeah, go ahead. Why are you the way you are? I, it would have to be about the tradition. Why do you hate tradition so much? Why, why, and it, because he's constantly talking about tradition as something that's... Like a cancer. Yeah. yeah. And I would just, I wish we could just know like cut through all the whatever, the truth. What's the reason behind it? You know, and people want to say all kinds of things, you know, unity and division and all these words that people like to throw out there. But like, what's his real motivation behind it? What's the end game? Um, Because you can't have these traditional communities thriving, young families, parishes overflowing, you know, vocations are up in the traditional communities. And yet we're trying to eradicate tradition from the face of the earth under the skies of unity or whatever it is that we're trying to do. So like, just say what it is. Just just tell me, because I'd have a lot more respect for you if you would just say, what is the end game? You know, what you're trying to accomplish. And I don't know that we're ever going to get that, not in his lifetime and probably not in ours, where we'll ever find out what the real thing was here. Sad. It's sad, but... But I've said in in previous videos, and I know that you share the same thing. Thanks be to God, my faith doesn't hinge on this man. You know, and he will, you know, he's a a temporary occupant of this, the chair of St. Peter. And he will go and we might get somebody that is way worse than Pope Francis. We We might get somebody who's better. It doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter. You know, honestly, it doesn't matter. It might be hard for us, whatever, but whoever we get is who the Lord is allowing for us to get as the Pope, and it's fine. You know, I mean, our hope is in him, our trust is in him. Not the Pope. And it's not in the Pope. So we can have good Popes, bad Popes, everything in between. That's not what's going to rattle us as Catholics, at least not for me and for you, right? I thank you so much for spending this time with me. Just another, just a lighthearted video so you could get to know us just a little bit more. And until next time. Take care. Bye. God bless.